Thank you, Simona, for that introduction and, and to Tino and Anandita for inviting me to participate uh, today. So I will just read some, some comments and, and also I'll, I'll speak a little bit freely, but hopefully I will keep the, the comments short because I know we are also short on time. Um, so with that, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just sort of speak under the rubric of what I'm thinking in terms of scale authoritarianism and urban sustainability, uh, which are, are important themes in my own research, but also important themes in, uh, in the book. So the concept of sustainability is, is as everybody and this that that's listening uh, is well aware, is incredibly nebulous. Uh, it can mean many different things for different people. Um, but however vague it, the term might be, it has a very global reach today. Uh, it pervades formal and informal politics. Uh, it unfolds in parliaments, corporate boardrooms, local farmers markets, and of course, architecture studios and classrooms. Um, yet sustainability has also been slower to permeate some contexts than others. And many parts of the global South, including uh, the three case studies in predatory urbanism, Qatar, Malaysia, and India uh, are often seen to be holdouts or sort of latecomers to adopting uh, policies to promote sustainability in their cities and, and just more generally. Uh, but as the book shows, that situation has changed pretty dramatically in recent years and state planners all across the world uh, are investing pretty heavily in these various sustainability programs and all range of efforts uh, in, the, in the more cynical term, which I actually share uh, the, the cynicism that, that it comes out in the book as well about greenwashing, um, that these a lot of these projects, these efforts are greenwashing particular development agendas. But this is happening within a global context where quote unquote being green uh, is seen as a, a sort of a marker of progressive thinking and sort of a way to show that you're being modern. Uh, so the nationalistically minded planners um, in the private and public sector, I would, I would note, uh, are frequently harnessing that image uh, and ideals of sustainability to index their, in, their aspirations to global leadership and to advance uh, their development agendas as being ultra modern. Uh, so in considering these issues through the lens of predatory uh, urbanism, Tino and Andita draw our attention to the broader, glo uh, uh, the broader social and spatial reach of mega projects that aim to sell this vision of being green and modern. So I wanna to just touch on a handful of issues that the book raises, um, but I should first acknowledge that I'm a scholar primarily of the Arabian Peninsula. So I come to this conversation with a particular regional bias um, and particularly enjoyed the, the parts of the book focusing on the Gulf countries. Um, but that said, I'm also a scholar of spectacle as, as you heard my book on the geopolitics of spectacle is about spectacular capital city projects in Central Asia, uh, the Gulf and Southeast Asia. So I'm intimately familiar with a a lot of the dynamics that they describe, um, but also the power of a trans-regional inter-Asian analytical approach. And I'll come back to that point. Um, Lastly, I should also say, as a geographer, I'm also a scholar of authoritarianism and the, the other forthcoming book that you heard about, about spatializing authoritarianism um, is, is also a lens that I was sort of reading uh, predatory urbanism through. So with those caveats, um, I'll just highlight three of the themes that I think are worth further discussion, um, probably not here today, given the, the length uh, that we have, um, but also just in the interdisciplinary community of urban scholarship and praxis. Um, the first the theme that I think really comes out in the book is this, um, that the act of defining a city is also about locating its hinterlands and scaling its hinterlands. Um, so what what the what the book sort of draws our attention to is to shift away from this idea that there's like the city and then there's some sort of somehow there's an externality um, but rather this I focus on uh, the the predatory nature of urbanism is to look at how those 
things that we often are taught to categorize as externalities, how those things are brought in um, and consumed and, and bringing that inside. So th this is something that I've been really interested in as well in my book on spectacle, thinking about spectacle and its others and that those others have lots of different forms. And so with this idea of predatory urbanism, what we see is that sheer diversity of how those sort of hinterlands can be defined. And I think what the book does so well is it calls our attention to the, the fact that we can we can take that concept of a hinterland and we can be much more creative in how we think about that. Um, and that by doing that, by looking beyond the borders of a city um, in, in different ways is actually really productive. So we're not just thinking about, um, you know, the municipal border and the beyond, but also state borders of countries well beyond that. And the Gulf cities are a great example of this. Their hinterland reaches far into uh, many different parts of Asia and Africa. Africa uh, to get labor, but also to get resources, et, et cetera. So you can look beyond state borders, um, resource borders, thinking about things like sand, uh, uh, water, energy, all, all sorts of things. Uh, the imaginative borders, we didn't really talk about that, or the previous speakers didn't really speak too much about that, but how um, ideas circulate in a particular way uh, and, and how this is another way of imagining a kind of hinterland or the extension of a, of a city. So um, the second theme that I, I found particularly rich uh, and, and worth further discussion and consideration is, is just the power of this trans-regional research, uh, which, which I mentioned I, I myself have done as well. Um, and, and I think what, what the book shows and, and what I've always enjoyed about this international trans-regional uh, work is that you can, you can use it to kind of unpack some of the assumptions that you have about basic concepts. Um, so some of those basic concepts like authoritarianism or sustainability so how do you locate these phenomena? How do you define them? Um, Cross-regional research really forces us not to rely on oversimplified versions of how those things are understood, how they are interpreted locally, how they're practiced locally, um, and, and just in general, how you then solve an issue like authoritarianism or unsustainable practices, right? Uh, so I think that transregional research kind of de it destabilizes a lot of those essences that, that can often kind of creep into these conversations about something like authoritarianism or uh, sustainability. So um, I think uh, then we'll kind of just move quickly to the topic of authoritarianism and the environment, which is the third sort of major theme that, that I really um, uh, focused on in, in my own reading of the book because I, I really do think that there there needs to be a lot more uh, attention to how uh, authoritarian practices creep into the broader like communities related to sustainability, to environmentalism, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many intersections uh, that, that need more attention rather than just waving this environmentally friendly flag and assuming that all is good and, and we can all hold hands. That doesn't work that way, uh, as, as wonderful as that would be. Um, so certainly the, the book covers the issue of smart cities and smart cities on surveillance issues. This is a major issue that, uh, that, that brings into question a number of issues related to authoritarianism and how you have accountability, data protection, privacy, um, all, all of those sorts of questions that, that need to be brought to, to the, those conversations. So um, the, the legitimacy of these kinds of practices, though, is tied to uh, the, the agenda, the effort, the push to become uh, sustainable. But I, th I think what the focus of, of the book also on mega projects really draws our attention to is how this, these kinds of projects, the, the big iconic type ones, um, they do a lot to entrench state power uh, because many of those sustainability projects that, that are being funded under this rubric go to those people who are connected, the elites that are connected, and whether those are royal family members in a place like Qatar or uh, if they are just financial and political elites in other places like Malaysia or India, for example. Um, so what, what you have in, in this particular case is that you have that kind of re-entrenchment of these elite networks, which then tend to uh, solidify authoritarian regimes and, and authoritarian political practices uh, more 
generally. So even if it's not a state-based regime, but it's just authoritarian practices of planning or um, design, you know, introducing a, a big project. Um, so toward the end of the book, Tina and Andy Dub reflect on uh, an important question that is raised by Andrew Gardner in 2014, which is, can a sustainable urban environment really be master planned? And they reply that our answer is no. Uh, the top-down master planned cities and mega redevelopments we have seen in this book indulge their visions of sustainable development and economic diversification away from fossil fuels, but in reality um, predate uh, scarce resources to try to stay afloat in an increasingly competitive uh, offering of destinations worldwide. So I think this is this is an interesting conclusion. You know that you can't you you perhaps can't master plan a sustainable community or urban environment, but I think that there's still so many people that like hold on to that aspiration in some way, um, which I find fascinating. How is it that people come to this idea that they can just somehow engineer this miracle and, you know, a sustainable environment, but they don't see that as authoritarian? That issue, like how do people just make that assumption? That issue is, is incredibly important if we're to understand how you introduce sustainable practices without just re-entrenching authoritarian practices. Um, so I think that, that, that th those kinds of questions are the qu questions for, for practitioners and in the classroom and, and in, a, in a, range of, uh, a range of different spaces. So I think at the end of the book, then um, the Tina and Andita suggest that we can do more to sort of, this is a, a quote here, rethink the dichotomy of the city versus the environment uh, towards a much more entangled ontology of this kind of idea of humanity and nature. And I think it's really interesting that they close with this because it brings us directly back to the ideas of Ebenezer Howard um, and his famous Garden Cities of Tomorrow, which was first published in 1898. Um, and so that book sort of set off the so-called Garden Cities movement and it proved to become like one of the most influential calls for greening cities all around the world. Um, but as you know, I've, I've done a lot of my research previously in the, in the uh, post-Soviet countries. And if you look at the history of the Garden Cities concept in the Soviet world um, and how that took place, you can see that Howard's ideas of equality and justice that, that this Garden Cities movement was supposed to introduce, uh, marrying town and country and a sort of joyous union which will spring new hope, new life, and new civilization. Um, they were so quickly in the Soviet Union, these ideas and aspirations were so quickly contorted into the service of this authoritarian state. And, and I think this is again that tension that I personally am, am really interested in trying to understand where it originates and how you, how you move against it. Um, so if, if that happened in the Soviet context and, and many other places around the world, Ankara, for example, you know, the, another place that adopted these ideas, uh, also authoritarian today. Um, in, in short, if, if we are going to green our cities and deepen our understanding of humanity and nature and sort of look at this interplay between cities and, and nature, um, I think we just need to be constantly vigilant of the creep of authoritarian practices. Um, at the end of the day, I would say that maybe should be the, our mission for every realm of life, whether urban or not. So I'll leave it there, thank you.